Doc, uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? Why did he say it like that? DeLorean? Well, because back in 1985, if you were driving a fully stainless steel gull wing door DeLorean, then you were driving a relatively slow, unreliable piece of well, at the time Back to the Future released, the DeLorean Motor Company was bankrupt and had been out of business for three years. A business that's last moments coincided with its founder being charged with drug trafficking by the FBI. When you think of Porsche, you're thinking quality German engineering founded by Ferdinand Porsche. When you think of a Ferrari, you're thinking of an elegant Italian sports car pioneered by Enzo Ferrari. But when you think of a DeLorean, you're likely thinking Dr. Emmett Brown, Marty McFly and Biff. Anybody home? Hey! Think with fly thing. You're likely not thinking of John DeLorean, but maybe you should be. Look at this logo. It's the original logo of the DeLorean Motor Company. Now look at this logo. It's the same logo and the company has the exact same name, but it actually represents two completely separate companies with two completely separate founders. But before DeLorean's business and public image would crumble in a 1982 FBI hidden camera drug bust, he'd enjoyed years of fame as the motor industry's bad boy. He was a non-conformist that quickly flew to the top of General Motors by going behind the back of the executive team to release the car everyone wanted, but GM would never build. You see, when he joined General Motors back in 1956, he joined the Pontiac division. At the time, Pontiacs were the car your grandparents drove and sales reflected it. John DeLorean wanted to change that. He had an idea to put the big engine from their flagship Pontiac Bonneville into the smaller Pontiac Tempest, essentially sparking the muscle car movement of the late 1960s and early 70s. But General Motors executives would never allow it. In fact, they had a specific rule against putting overpowered engines into small cars just to make them go fast. And DeLorean knew that. But he also knew that if he could get it over the line and it worked, he would have single-handedly saved a division of General Motors, the biggest company in the world at the time. His solution was to sell it as an optional upgrade for the Pontiac Tempest, bypassing GM's strict rules and pushing it to market. Of course, in their first year of production, they only sold 32,000 GTOs, catapulting him to becoming the youngest ever general manager of Pontiac at aged 40. Helping essentially create the muscle car movement by defying top executives made him a bit of an icon. A once relatively conservative married man was now a divorced corporate rebel wearing an open button shirt, working out, traveling to Hollywood and dating models. He was defiant, he was cool, and the GM executives hated it but they loved the profit and therefore bonuses he generated. He was an engineer by trade, but his keen ability to develop and market a product saw him at the top of GM by the early 70s. Despite being the vice president of car and truck production, he hated the direction that GM executives were taking with the company. They started doing things like offering rebates or cash back, which he said was merely a way of convincing customers to buy bland cars that they're not interested in. In 1973, he left GM when the company turned on him after an internal presentation that he wrote was leaked to the Detroit News. But he claimed he didn't want the job anyway because being that high up just meant sitting in meetings all day. He said that even at $650,000 a year, which is the equivalent of over $4 million today, if the job's not satisfying, you do something else. So in the 1960s, he seized the opportunity to market a car that rebelled against the old fashioned 50s. In the 1970s, well, there was an energy crisis. This is NBC Nightly News, Wednesday, October 17th. The oil producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. All of us must learn to waste less energy. John DeLorean turned from producing gas guzzling muscle cars to producing what he called an ethical car. A car that had the best style, the least environmental impact, offered the best value and had the best safety. He essentially wanted the DeLorean to do it all. So he pulled together a dream team, Giorgetto Gagaro, a legendary Italian sports car designer along with Bill Collins, a colleague from GM that helped create the GTO. The car they designed was a visual masterpiece and the press loved it, but whether they could actually fund it and get it built was another question. Projects of this kind, new projects, and a brand new design of a car is bound to be risky. 
he ended up securing a deal with the UK government worth over a hundred million pounds. There seems to be a reasonable chance of success and all of us wanted to succeed. But this deal wasn't for a factory in England or Scotland or Wales. Instead, in the heart of war-torn Northern Ireland, an area of complete instability where there was severe unemployment. The idea was that building a massive factory meant creating jobs and therefore stability. And so in 1981, over half a decade after the DeLorean Motor Company was initially founded, the DeLorean DMC-12 started rolling off the production line. The problem was, it significantly differed to the ethical car DeLorean had initially conceived of. While it certainly had that same wow factor, that's about all it had, because in actually producing the thing they had to make some compromises and the engine was the biggest. When the DeLorean launched, it wasn't just underwhelmingly slow, but it also suffered from poor build quality, with one of the multiple recalls being for the throttle cable which would stick in freezing temperatures. It was also eye-wateringly expensive at $25,000 and almost $30,000 a year later. But the DeLorean didn't just suffer from poor build quality, or a slow engine, or a lack of funds, or being manufactured in the middle of a war zone. It also launched during the middle of the biggest recession since the Second World War. Good evening. I'm speaking to you tonight to give you a report on the state of our nation's economy. I regret to say that we're in the worst economic mess since the Great Depression. And so, by 1982, the DeLorean Motor Company was out of time, and next to broke, having only produced 8,600 cars. Having originally hoped to pre-sell over 30,000 cars, the UK government wasn't very happy with their investment and John DeLorean was out of money. Unless the DeLorean Motor Company could somehow source millions of pounds, it would go into receivership, and his company and dream would be lost. And so a last resort for sourcing millions of pounds was through pounds of cocaine. A suitcase full of cocaine was put before him, and he called it better than gold. Better than gold? <laughs> gold weighs more than that, for God's sake. A few minutes later, the FBI arrived, and John DeLorean was put under arrest. What DeLorean didn't know was that it was all a setup by the FBI. It was such a setup that on the 15th of August 1984, a jury ruled that it was a clear case of government entrapment and found him not guilty. But his arrest marked the end for the DeLorean Motor Company, with its assets being sold off in liquidation. And that's where it should have ended, with a car that could have been, but wasn't. With millions of pounds worth of investment lost. With a lost dream that one day a DeLorean would be a household name that actually meant something. It could have been, it should have been, but it wasn't. At least, that was until... The DeLorean DMC-12 will always be the time machine, cementing John DeLorean's name in pop culture for decades to come. Now I don't need to tell you about the cult following that this car received, with people purchasing DeLoreans just to transform them into time machine replicas, but I do need to tell you about this. You see, it didn't matter how big the movies were, the DeLorean Motor Company was gone. And because of that, after the release of Back to the Future, John DeLorean wrote this letter. Last week, I had the opportunity to see a screening of Back to the Future in New York, and want you to know I think it was absolutely brilliant. I was particularly pleased that the DeLorean motor car was all but immortalized in the film, and want to thank all those responsible for the outstanding job they did in presenting the DMC as the vehicle of the future. They can join my soon-to-be-revived design team at any time. But it was never revived. In fact, the company's IP was auctioned off to the highest bidder, meaning the patents, drawings, logo, it all went. The man that eventually secured it was Stephen Wynn. He had capitalized on the DeLorean's poor build quality by opening a repair shop in Southern California. Once he owned the assets, he rebranded his company as the DeLorean Motor Company, and went from doing repairs to full restorations of DeLoreans. Today, over 40 years after the death of THE DeLorean Motor Company, the new DeLorean Motor Company is launching the DeLorean Alpha 5. Is that the car of the future? You make up your own mind. But you can't deny that the new company is completely trading off of the brand recognition of THE DeLorean. A brand that to some, reminds them of a corporate rebel, and to others, reminds them of a drug bust. But to most, reminds them of the time machine. 
Without the movie, it's very likely that the DMC-12 would have just been another car that you've never heard of. Thanks for watching.